Hey guys, if you like what you're seeing, be sure to click below to subscribe and share. It's not just about the photograph, it's the outdoor experience. Keep in mind everything that you need to know about photography. F-stop, shutter speed, lens selection. Nice photo, I've got beautiful light now. Oh my God. I'm your host, Doug Gardner, and your wild photo adventure starts now. concealment is one I feel is highly overlooked in the field of wildlife and nature photography. Now there are lots of opportunities to get great images of wildlife without worrying about camouflage and concealment, such as in national parks and refuges. However, there are going to be those times when you want to get images of elusive animals and mastering these techniques will greatly improve your success. I'm Doug Gardner and your wild photo adventure starts now. So I got permission from a local landowner to come and photograph a variety of wildlife on their property. Now this particular piece of property is both open farmland and beautiful hardwood cypress swamp. And that's where we are right now. The landowner has told me that he sees the wood ducks coming in early in the morning to this particular corner of the swamp. So already the landowner has given me most of the information I need. It's up to me now to find a good location to put my blind and photograph these birds. Oh yeah, this is looking like it's going to be an ideal spot for wood ducks. Spring is the best time of year to try to photograph these amazing little birds for a couple reasons. Number one, this is when they breed and so they're going to be a lot more active. The drakes are going to be chasing the hens around so you're going to get a lot of behavior. The other thing is, is that the drakes, their plumage is going to be in, in prime color so they're amazingly colored and, and makes for some amazing photographs. Now, some of the things I'm looking for is food and nesting cavities. And I'm seeing feathers on the water right here. I saw some acorns right here. So this, this is looking like it's gonna be a good spot. What we need to do now is kind of determine where our light's gonna come up at, where the sun's gonna rise, where it's gonna set, and how we're gonna situate our blind. I wanna put my blind up in or next to some thick cover. Popping a blind up in the wide open here in the middle of the water, it's not going to do you any good. It'll stick out um, really bad. The, the birds will spot you immediately. Yeah, I think this is going to be a good spot right here. The, a lot of tangles already here from the ice storm blowing these trees down. This is going to work pretty good. What I'm going to do is just tuck it back in here as far as I can. And that way it doesn't stick out. Uh, this is called a chair blind and uh, it's got a built-in camp chair and then uh, apparatus like a baby carriage it just comes right over top of you and drops down it's very very quick and easy to set up and you're off and running all you do in the morning is come in raise that up hop in poke your camera lens out through here and you're good to go so this looks pretty good actually 
if I stand back and look at this, it could, I could probably get away with just that. It's got this leafy uh, die cut material in here that helps break up the silhouette of this thing. I could almost get away with just doing this. But I'm gonna take some of these branches and just kind of break up the silhouette a little bit more. You don't always have to have a pop-up blind, but it, it makes blinding up a lot easier to do. The name of the game here is blending into the environment and concealing your movement while you're in the blind. The blind itself sitting here, almost always it needs some type of brush on it to help it blend in. However, you know, natural blinds, 100% natural blinds work extremely well because you're using materials from the area and the materials that the animals are used to seeing already. So that's the best way to do it. However, it takes a lot more time and work to get the blind right because you have to lay many layers of material on there in order to make it dense enough that the animal can't see you moving around in there. However, it is the best way. Also, you know, you want the blind and the camera as low a profile as possible and I want the lens as close to eye level to the duck as I possibly can get. Now in this area, this swamp, the farmer told me that the water level in here rises and lowers pretty frequently, so I'm leaving myself a little bit of room. Normally, my lens, I, I like to have it about 10 inches, 12 inches off the water. That's ideal for shooting waterfowl. In this case, I'm more like two feet, but I think with a 500 millimeter lens and the duck being off at a distance, I think I'll still have that nice intimate low angle of view uh, that I'm looking for. Another thing I like to do is to come out here where I know the, the birds are gonna be, well, where I hope the birds are gonna be, and set up little scenarios. Wood ducks love to sit on things and preen after they've eaten. They'll come in in the morning, they'll feed heavily, and then they'll sit on perches and preen. And those can be some really amazing shots. So I kind of set up little mini studios here in my scene in hopes that they will use them. They don't always use them. Matter of fact, they rarely use them. Um, but there is those few magical moments when they will use it and it'll look amazing. So I'll come in here and provide little perches for them to sit up on and these palm fronds I clipped right over here. So this is natural stuff from the area. They're used to seeing it. And I will put them pretty much just like I cut them. And that was almost kind of the way they were. All right, that looks pretty good. Now we gotta do is get in the blind and I uh, hope something uses this area and possibly even comes and sits on our perch. Other thing is while we're out here, Look back at the blind and make sure it blends in properly. If it doesn't, if it sticks out, you go back and keep working on it until you get it right. The thing about these birds, you've got one chance. If they make you out, they're out of here. And there's a good possibility they may not even come and use this particular area anymore. They may come in the next day and land 200 yards away and never come over here. So make sure you've got everything right the first go around. So now I'm just gonna let the blind sit for a few days, let the birds get accustomed to it being in this area. And I'll come back on a day when I know I'm gonna have good weather and we'll see what happens. All right, it looks like it's gonna be another beautiful morning. Got clear skies, I can see stars everywhere. Birds are starting to sing, it's still early. It's an hour before sunrise. You always wanna get in the blind early because wood ducks especially, they're gonna start flying about 30 minutes before the sun comes up, about the time you start getting that nice glow. So that gives you 30 minutes to get in there, let things settle down and get quiet. So now once I get in the blind, I'm not gonna be able to talk. So after the shoot, we'll talk about what happened or well, I hope something happens and uh, we'll learn a little bit more about this blind setup.
Well, the birds have moved off now and I haven't seen them for quite a while now. So, you know, I call that a successful morning. Even though we only had three or four pairs of wood ducks swimming around, uh, you know, you only have to have one to get a great image. So for a first morning out and a first morning blind setup, I call that a success. Now, in the mornings before you get in the blind, there's a few things you need to remember. Number one, you need to make sure everything that you're gonna need is in your jacket pockets. Extra batteries, extra memory cards, teleconverters, anything you may need needs to be in those jacket pockets because remember, you're working in water. You're not gonna have anywhere to put an extra bag. Now, once you're set up, ready to go, it's just sit back and relax. A lot of times, it'll be an hour, hour and a half till you have enough light to photograph these birds by. Remember, you're, you're under a canopy of a thick swamp and it takes a while for that light to hit the water. So just be patient. The two most important things you need to keep in mind when you're working out of a blind, a blind of any type for any situation, is movement discipline and sound discipline. We've gone to great extents to try to conceal our movement, but there's still areas that an animal can pick up your movement inside the blind. These windows, net windows that you look out of and the portholes that you stick your lens out of, those are little gaps that an animal can see you through. So you still have to be very careful about movement. I like to say, think before you move. Every movement you make needs to be slow and deliberate. Don't do any extra moving around that, that's unnecessary. And try to do everything in a one fluid motion. So if I have a duck swimming in on the right hand side and my lens is pointed this way, I know I've got to get my hands to the lens, loosen the ball head, turn the camera, and get my face down to the camera. That's a lot of movement to try to conceal. So I keep my eye on the bird and in one fluid motion, I, I slowly move in, one hand on the camera, one hand on the ball head, loosen, gradually bringing my head down to the camera, keeping my eye on the bird as long as possible. Now, if the bird reacts to this movement, you need to stop. If he starts bobbing his head up or kind of frantically swimming in a circle, freeze. Wait till he resumes whatever he was doing before you resume your movement. Also, sound discipline. Pretty much kind of goes along with movement discipline. Every move you make is gonna make a sound, whether it's your jacket rustling or your arm hitting the side of the blind or your feet splashing in the water. Uh, everything makes a sound and you have to be conscious of that. It can be something as simple as taking an extra memory card out of your little box and the click or the click of your exposure dial on your camera or your shutter going off. Everything makes a sound and those sounds, something that simple can spook the bird and you're done. You're done for the day. You constantly want to monitor your exposure so because you may only have a brief second to get a photograph but you don't want to trip that shutter until you know you have enough light to photograph the duck by. Well, how do you monitor exposure without tripping the shutter? You know, because we're all used to taking a test shot, checking our histogram, take another test shot, check the histogram. What I like to do is I like to go to live view mode and that way I can just look at the back of the LCD screen and monitor the light levels. And I can get pretty close. I can just sit here and silently adjust my shutter speed, my aperture, and my ISO without making any noise at all. And then when I see that the light levels have got high enough that I'm getting the exposure that I want, the birds are in the area, then I can get in behind my camera and start tripping the shutter and taking actual photographs. When you get ready to leave the blind, scan the area very careful, listen very carefully for several minutes before you get up and get out of your blind for the day. Make sure the subject is not in the area because if you spook him off, if you didn't see him sitting right over here and you spook him off, you've educated him. He knows now there's something strange about that blind. There's something that shouldn't be there. So the next time you come in here, if you want to use the blind again, you might not have as good a success. So, you know, getting out of the blind and easing out of the area is just as critically important as coming into the blind and being silent in the morning. Well, even though the ducks are gone for the morning, I still have a few other unique blind situations that I want to share with you. So let's go take a look at that. Now this morning, when we were in the swamp photographing wood ducks, I heard a lot of goblin coming out of this field up here. 
there's nothing out here now, but we were right down here in the swamp and this is a ridge that just drops right into the swamp. So they were in this field for sure, but I need, this is a mighty big field and I need to locate exactly where they were if I'm gonna have any chance of, of getting on them this afternoon, try to get some shots. With elusive animals, especially turkey, you gotta put your time in scouting. If you don't do the scouting, you're not gonna reap the rewards. And sometimes scouting may take a few days to really nail down where they're at. In this particular situation, a, the landowner's already told me that he has turkey on the property, so we know that. I was in the swamp just a few hundred yards away this morning and I heard them gobbling directly behind me, so I know they're at least in this field in the mornings, so we've done that. But if, if I didn't have that information, the way I would start out would be come into the, the property, start looking for tracks, look for feathers, look for food areas like acorns or or this is a, a grass field that's got some volunteer wheat coming up in it, uh, which supports a lot of insects uh, in the spring when it starts to warm up and turkeys love to feed on insects. So we know we're in a hot area. While we're scouting, we also have to keep in mind light direction, where the sun is gonna rise and where it's gonna fall. So I was in the swamp this morning and the sun rose behind me in the east, which is right over here. So the sun's gonna set in the west back here behind us. So as I walk along looking for sign, looking where the turkeys might be, I need to keep in mind that I need, if it's gonna be an afternoon shoot, I need to be on the west side, um, you know, so the birds will be front lit or maybe even side lit, would be really nice. So that's gonna put my blinding area being somewhere along the left side of the field here. So let's go check out the edge of the field, see if we can find out exactly where those birds were sitting this morning and try to build us a natural blind. Yeah, this is looking really good. I'm seeing a lot of sign here. The birds have scratched up the ground a good bit and turkey feathers. So that is a very good sign. All right, so I think this is gonna be a good place to build a natural blind. Turkeys generally like to roost over water. So I am between where the turkeys are now and where they're going to go roost tonight. So hopefully they're gonna come in and come right on past me and we'll get some great shots. We've got good thick cover to build a natural blind in, so let's get busy building that blind. Natural blinds are my favorite way to blind up. It's much more convincing, it's a lower profile, and it makes me a lot more mobile. When you learn how to do this effectively, you can do it quickly and easily, just in a matter of minutes, and anywhere you're at. So uh, this is one of the better ways, but it takes a little bit more work. I've chosen this thick myrtle bush, Number one, it's thick, it's hard for the animals to see through this vegetation, and it's an overhanging limb, which creates some shade, and I can tuck back in here, just like a sniper. A sniper always shoots from cover, so you want to back up in here as far as you can. And I start by getting my camera placement first. I've got a, a turkey chair here, which is a, a very low sitting chair, which will get you low to the ground and I'm gonna have my camera about this height because you know when a turkey sits upright, you wanna be kinda of eye level to him. So this is gonna be about the height I wanna be. So let's go ahead and get our chair and our camera in position. And then we'll build our blind around this. So that's gonna be about right. Now, you don't have to do this. Um, it's always a good idea. Before we start putting branches up around us, I like to stand up a little bit of material. This is a simple, turkey hunting blind. It's just a piece of material with stakes on it. And you can take this and stick it in the ground in front of your lens and then kind of wrap it around you. Cause a lot of times these turkeys will come in behind you and you know, you, can, you don't just have to worry about being camouflaged from the front. You gotta be camouflaged on the sides and the back too. We've got some trees at our back. So I think we'll be okay there. And I just punched this stuff in the ground around me. And then we're gonna start cutting some vegetation from the area. Now we've got a thick myrtle bush we're under, so I wanna use, and there's a lot of pine too, young pines on both sides of us. So I'm gonna go down a good ways from this location and clip some branches off of another myrtle bush and some small little pine limbs, and I'm gonna come back in and uh, stack them up. Okay, this is looking pretty good. Now that we've got a wall of green vegetation, we've got to start clipping out a hole for our lens to stick out of because we don't want to obstruct our, our field of view. You only have one chance to get this right. We're 
because if they detect you, you're done. As soon as the turkey throws his head up and they start putting, put, 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 you're done. Done for the day, might as well get up and go home. So do your work now, do all your homework, get it right. Take a few extra minutes and get it right. I'm pretty satisfied with this. All right, this looks pretty good. Again, check your shooting lanes to make sure nothing's in the way of the lens. I think we're good there. And my background looks good, so I think we're good to go. So let's go ahead and, as always, face mask and gloves. You wanna to try to conceal yourself best as possible because there are gaps between these limbs and stuff that the animal can still see you moving around. We've done the best we can to try to conceal our movement and our, and our position, but we still need to be careful about, um, about movement. Remember movement discipline and sound discipline, which we talked about with the wood ducks. Think before you move. Know what you've got to do to move that lens to wherever the bird's gonna be and move very slowly and very deliberately. So uh, I think we're good. Let's sit back and wait now. It's about two or three hours before sunset. So I think we'll be good. Well, that worked out pretty good. The birds have moved on now, but we got some pretty decent shots, I think. Some nice environmental shots of the gobbler strutting. Uh, we had several jakes come in, a few hens, but only one really good gobbler. It would've been nice to have him a little bit closer, but you know what? I'll keep coming back to this spot and see if I can uh, get some tighter shots of him. The gobblers have moved on now down into the swamp and that's where they're probably gonna to roost tonight. So let's ease out of here, and tomorrow I'm gonna to show you another setup for photographing birds. When photographing waterfowl, birds of prey, and other game birds, it usually means you gotta be completely concealed so they can't see any movement whatsoever. With songbirds and woodpeckers, other birds like that, you can get away with, with a little less camouflaging. Now, a few days ago, uh, while scouting for turkeys, I saw a redhead woodpecker flying from tree to tree in here. And as I got a little bit closer, I noticed he was excavating a cavity in an old dead tree. That's a telltale sign that he's building a nest. I'm always trying to get eye level to my subject. With the turkeys, we were low to the ground. With the ducks, we were low to the water. Deer, you want to be, you know, up on your knees or in a little chair. With that woodpecker, I want to get up on eye level to him. That'll make a much more dramatic shot. And the way I usually do that is with a climbing stand. It's a very unique type of stand because I latch it around the tree and it climbs up the tree as I sit and stand. I've simply taken a few branches and zip strapped them around the frame of the stand. And now we'll get in this and we'll work our way up. As always, you wanna have a safety harness when you're working off the ground. All right, this is about where I wanna be right here. And I see the cavity. First things first, we wanna make sure we have a strap fastened around the tree to hook our harness to. It's a pretty windy day up here today. 
All right. The first time you come up a tree to photograph a specific nest, you've got to watch very carefully for the bird's behavior. If the bird comes back to a nearby tree but won't actually come to the cavity or the nesting area, you're too close. Back out immediately and come back at a later date. Let the bird settle down. Now when you come back, you can select a tree that's a little bit further away and try it again. But watch that animal's behavior. The animal will always tell you if you're too close. You never want to jeopardize the success of a nest for a, a good image. It's, it's not worth it. Okay, he's back on the tree now. What a beautiful little bird. This is early in the nesting stage. This bird's still working on the cavity. You can see the, where they've chiseled out the fresh wood from around the edge of the hole. Wait till the bird has left the area before you come up the tree and before you leave. So if you do that, you don't spook the bird and you'll be able to come back to the same site time and time again and get some amazing shots throughout the nesting process. If you're lucky, you may even get the fledglings coming out. I hope you've enjoyed this week's show as much as I have and learned a little more about the art of concealment. Mastering these techniques will greatly improve your success when photographing elusive animals. More information about this week's show is available online. And remember, it's not just about the photograph, it's the outdoor experience. I'm Doug Gardner for Wild Photo Adventures. Shelter and the jig with his nesting cavity cavitatis. Don't trap, trap, don't trap. Area that you can, uh, that the, the ah, I'm babbling. Hey guys, if you like what you're seeing, be sure to click below to subscribe and share.